The project that we're here to discuss today is called Training Beyond Possible Vocational Rehab Counselors. Um, it is a project that is grant funded by the Department of Education, and it is a scholarship in order to increase the number of highly qualified rehab counselors within the state as well as the nation. So we'd like to um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I um, am personally a rehab counselor first and foremost, um, and it has long time been a passion of mine and a very rewarding um, career experience in a many different aspects of the profession that I have worked. And I am appreciative that I have an opportunity to um, provide an opportunity for grants and um, RSA scholarships to new potential applicants. I myself was a RSA scholar when I was um, in college and I found it a very rewarding and, and obviously um, it projected my opportunities that um, I would not have had otherwise. So I hope that you can look at this as much more a viable chance for you to launch your careers as well. We will give an overview of the project, um, expectations and purposes for the grant, um, talk a little bit about our student organization that we currently have within the rehab counseling um, program here at FIU, and talk about the payback agreements and understanding specifically germane to the project and the, uh, receiving the grant. So um, if you want to know any additional information, if you haven't already gone to the Masters in Counselor Education Rehab Counseling Track website, the link is at the bottom for you to peruse at your leisure if you have not, either after this or, or in any other time that you would like and to get more specific information about the program. So the profession of rehab counseling is kind of what I mentioned earlier. It is working with persons with disabilities, um, ensuring that you provide uh, whatever services, whatever resources that an individual may need to enhance their quality of life. Um, the ultimate goal is to get them to work or back to work if a person has um, acquired a disability from an injury or just a chronic illness and they can no longer perform the duties of a job task that they had. Um, a rehab counselor is there to help them with transferable skills to determine if there is a new job or career path for them to help them get back to work. Or and or if the, the idea is for them to live more independently whatever that means. The goal is to help them to break down the barriers, whether they're physical barriers or whether they're psychological, psychosocial barriers, levels of accommodation and advocates see that for those individuals to live the most highly productive quality of life that they can. It's what the rehab counselor profess about. Um, the application checklist, um, this kind of goes to a lot of the questions that um, we polled you is that there is an online application process and it's $30. The university, official university college transcripts are needed for the application from all institutions that you have um, matriculated through by the time that you apply. Um, and program specific requirements are also needed in addition. These requirements are that 3.0, your last 60 credits. Now, if you're a bachelor student, um, the last 60 credits, are oftentimes that GPA looks somewhat different if you look at that versus your overall GPA. Um, Mostly people do better in the last 60 credits because, you know, you're more into your major, you're more interested in the courses, you've had two years of excitement in undergrad and you kind of 
get an opportunity to focus a little more those last two years, last 60 credit hours. So sometimes looking at your overall GPA might not, um, might not be as telling as what your last 60 credit hours um, GPA would look like. So be certain that you are looking at those last 60 credits. Um, this is a master's program and we do not require a GRE for admissions. We additional other requirements is that there is an applicant statement, a letter of intent. We call it a autobiographical statement. And what we're looking for in that statement is why are you um, so we want to know kind of your history, what you've done, um, how do you feel like this is relevant. There are some pointed questions on that autobiographical statement prompting that you must answer that lends us to get a feel of if this is the right profession for you, if you are a good fit for the profession. I highly, highly recommend that you do proofreading, that you do not rush through this component of the application. Um, the faculty in the program, we all read them. We, we take them very seriously because this is a master's program. We're also um, looking to see if you write well, if you're able to um, be successful at a graduate level. So take, take very cautious time and, and careful attention to how you respond and make sure you respond completely to every question prompted on your autobiographical statement. We also will need three letters of recommendation um, with your application. Those letters of recommendations can come from a previous professors, employers. Um, it's, it's helpful to get a variety of letters from different um, sources. Um, to show your flexibility. And we also need an updated resume. If you turn all of those things and they're all uh, acceptable, you will be invited for a interview with all the faculty. It's usually in a group interview manner. Um, and that interview, results of that interview, in addition to the foreign results of all of your other special specific requirements, will be how we determine admissions to the program. Now, for the rehab counseling track only, the um, counselor education program has three tracks, mental health, school, rehab counseling. This is typically about the rehab counseling track and specifically the deadline for the, the deadline for the rehab counseling track is November 1st. That's an extended deadline only for this track. Um, the initial deadline for um, the counselor education program for spring admissions is September 1st. So how we're going to utilize the deadlines to monitor and manage um, screening and pre-screening applications for the grant is that we're gonna still honor the initial screening deadline of September 1st. Um, if you would like to provide all of your documentation that I just mentioned on the previous screen that are required to have a completed application, you have an opportunity to send us your pre-screening documentation by August 25th. If that's something you want to do to make sure you have everything, give some feedback from us before you actually submit to the portal your application material. In addition, um, like I mentioned, the final, final, final deadline for admissions for the rehab counseling track only for spring 2021 is November 1st. If you missed the pre-screening and our initial screening of, of September 1, we will also do a pre-screening by October 18, 2020 for the November 1st final, final deadline. Now, why would this be significant? If it's November's the deadline, then why can't I just wait to November to give you all the application information? Well, this is for people who are really interested in becoming um, and being granted the scholarship. There are only a certain amount of slots. 
you are all welcome to apply to the rib counseling program. But even in that, because we do interview for all three tracks at the same time, there are only a limited amount of slots that are available. So in a sense, first come, first serve, if you're very interested and you want to be considered for the program, and even more so for the scholarship, I would recommend that you get your information in as soon as possible, considering the deadlines that are forthcoming. Um, the pre-screening application material can all be emailed to rehab at fiu.edu. This is just the pre-screening material. The information for the, the uh, actual applications has to go in the graduate studies portal. Which is how you would actually apply. After, you know, if you're interested in getting our feedback for pre-screening and then you actually apply to the program, remember that's not your final step of application process. You're just doing a pre-screening. When you're ready to apply, you have to go to admissions.fiu.edu um, and follow this link to apply to the actual program. So what is Project Beyond specifically? The purpose of it and why the Department of Education um, has granted um, universities monies to help facilitate the increase of highly qualified vocational rehab counselors. Um, there is a shortage of people who are considered highly qualified and what that definition means is that a person has a master's degree in rehab counseling from a KREP accredited university and that person has a, has a CRC, a certified rehabilitation counselor. That is the definition of a highly qualified individual who is a rehab professional. And because, you know, there are many other reasons why there are not as many, but the, but a lot of, um, individuals who are in the profession are older and they're, they've gone through the process of either retiring or moving in towards retirement. And a lot of the state requirements for being a vocational counselor, just a vocational counselor, um, has been decreased to not needing a master's, only a bachelor's degree and one year of um, experience. So because of that, the individuals with disabilities have not been getting the level of quality service that they need from their counselors because their knowledge base is limited. Their skill sets are limited because they have not matriculated through the proper channels to learn the, the amount of information and knowledge it would take for you to get a master's degree and a certified rehab counseling um, designation. So, because of that nationally, the um, Department of Education recognized that and that's why these um, grants have been available and awarded to certain universities. Excellent, excellent. Um, so the project will offer academic curriculum support. It will provide um, experience with diverse individuals with disabilities in high need settings within the South Florida area. Um, you will learn how to develop group cohesiveness through your um, classroom settings. There's a lot of um, interactive group projects. There's a lot of um, assignments that ensure that you're doing hands-on work, not only with your colleagues, but also with persons with disabilities in the communities. Um, we have in student involvement development, one of those things like I mentioned is we have our own student organization that um, we do different projects in the community nationally. Um, they do presentations and a lot of opportunities for you to hit the ground running and be um, an impact to the population of interest. Um, we assist you with graduate uh, field experience placements that does lead to employment 97.5% of the time. 
most of my students who enter field placement um, can do so at a rate where they are ending up employed with that agency either during their internship, meaning they get paid internships, or very shortly afterwards. There's no guarantee that you get a paid internship, but um, most of my students do. Um, and by most, I mean less than 2% don't. And that might be for other reasons that they may choose not to. Um, so right now, it's a very viable opportunity for you to not only gain that experience, but also, you know, start your career even before you graduate. Um, let's see. For scholarship requirements, again, one of the other reasons for one of those pre-screenings um, questions is that you must be a U.S. citizen or permanent residency. Why? Again, remember, this grant is funded by the Department of Education. So what you will find, the whole purpose of it is that when you graduate, the expectation is that you are now highly qualified rehab professional and you are to go to work to service the population that you've been recently trained to service. And there's a certain amount of service years requirements post-graduation if you are awarded the scholarship that is mandatory. Because it is mandatory that that's the case, you, you must be a resident or a U.S. citizen so we can ensure that you are able to stay in the, the um, country long enough to satisfy the service requirement post-graduation. Um, the second requirement is admissions to the program, the MS Counselor Education Rehab Counseling Program. We went through the discussion of how you get admitted to that program. That is one of the requirements of being um, a RSA scholar. You must have an undergraduate GPA of 3.0 or higher, your last 60 credits. And um, there must be an interest and commitment to servicing the individuals with disabilities. I understand about the, the interest in a scholarship and being able to get a master's degree and not having to take out student loans, and I understand all of that. But this particular scholarship really does lend itself only to individuals who have that passion, who have that interest, and any plan to work with this population post-graduation for a certain number of years. Um, after you meet those requirements, you will have an interview with Project Selection Committee, which often includes myself, one of my graduate assistants, and some rehab professional, whether they're on campus or in the community. Based on our need, our feelings that this person has a level of commitment to service of this population, this person has a true passion, this person gets it as, it, as we sometimes say in our profession, because we feel like the level of compassion that is um, needed for an individual to want to stay, to be desirable to stay in this profession and work well with this population has to be high. And we are very selective about individuals that we decide to enter into the program and, and more specifically the RSA scholarship. Oh, let me go back. So um, what does the scholarship cover? Um, the scholarship covers your tuition, your full tuition for, 90, for nine credits, which is full time for graduate school. So we will pay for nine credits um, each semester for tuition. Um, you must be a full time student in order to accept this scholarship. The, um, Graduate fees and the university fees, we will not pay. So um, most of the time, once, once you give us a, you give us your schedule and we pay your tuition fees, you still have to pay like the athletic fees, the health fees, 
uh, parking fees and those things. So you will still have a balance um, sometimes in the fall or spring, close to $195. Dollars and then in the, in the summertime, around $190 would be your balance that you would have to pay after we pay your tuition. Um, I will also say, um, in addition to the tuition coverage, we also offer stipends for individuals who are the RSA scholars. The stipends are provided once to usually once a semester, the amount will vary. Um, it just depends on how many scholars we have. It depends on um, how many other activities that the students have done within that academic year so that we can um, make sure that everybody is taken care of under in terms of the tuitions and conference requirements. But you will get a stipend and we recommend highly recommend we can't tell you what to do with the stipends per se but it is recommended that you know at the end of the the, the um, program you will have to take your certification exam which is roughly about four hundred dollars and to wish and books we don't pay for your books so sometimes we strongly recommend that you use the money towards paying for books and other academic needs that will help you alleviate from other financial stresses that you may have. Um, so that is another, another option that is provided within the um, RSA scholarship. We also um, give students opportunities to go to national conferences. Um, there are several, um, organizations within the profession of rehab counseling. Um, there's NCRE, there's NAMRAC, there's IR, there's ARCA. So students have an opportunity to be exposed to um, all types of national organizations, all types of professional development. I've had students get offered jobs at conferences, at workshops. Um, my students have had opportunities to present at these national conferences. So the, the um, opportunities are abound. Um, they've won awards for their presentations. I've seen students gain so much confidence from the time that they start this program to the end, simply because they've taken opportunities like the ones that are provided and afforded to them, and they've used them to the best of their benefits. Um, I am very proud of the RSA Scholar graduates. They have exceeded my expectations of the professional development and careers that they've embarked on upon um, based on their graduate studies here and just taking full opportunities and um, just opportunities from what they have to be offered from the grant. Um, SARCA is our student organization here at FIU. SARCA is a division of American Rehab Counseling Association, National Association, which is a umbrella division of American Counseling Association. Um, what um, Melissa did not mention, I don't know, is that she's also the president of SARCA here at FIU. And I will give a little opportunity to kind of do a pub for her organization um, at this moment. And if you have any questions later on, I'm pretty sure she will be able to answer those as well. But I will say that that is the organization that does go into community. We do also um, do collaborations with other student organizations. You do not have to be in the rehab counseling program to be a member of SARCA. You can um, be in, you can actually be invited to be a member if you're you're um, a affiliated with the university or other agencies and organizations. We work in collaboration with many different um, companies, agencies to provide all kinds of, of outreach in the, um, in the community. Anything you want to add, Melissa? No, I think you said it all, Dr. Russell. Thank you. But also, the only thing that I wanted to add is for people who are actually FIU students, you can join us through Panther Connect. I'm going to drop the link on the, on the chat box. 
you're welcome to join even if you don't, you don't want to pursue the master's in rehabilitation counseling right now. But if you're a sponsored grad student from any major, you can definitely join us. And just like Dr. Rosa was mentioning, like all these conferences, student organizations, all the things besides the strictly academic requirements for an university college or anything, it's going to enrich the social skills. So it's definitely an opportunity to train those skills, to learn those skills, but at the same time, you're giving back to the community by spreading awareness about people with disabilities, to teaching, and to just bringing more life to, to this niche, to this like, community. So thank you, Dr. Rosa. That was perfect. So, um, Kind of a recap, um, the minimum admissions requirements are demonstrating interest in working with individuals with disabilities, a personal interview with your project selection committee, um, completing a 60 credit rehab counseling program that meets the KCREP curricular requirements. And that's, that's the master's program. The master's program is the 60 credit program. And your exit examination requirement is that you take and pass your certification examination, your CRC, at the nearing the end of your program. So what that means is, you know, you have an exit examination, but it is the actual CRC. So once you get and pass it and graduate, you will never, never, never have to take that exam again in your profession career. Every five years you will renew it with CEUs, but that is the last time you ever have to take that exam. But it is a graduate requirement. And I will say that um, my students are very well prepared for the exam. We have a 98.5% pass rate for the first time. 100% of my scholars have passed the exam, but 98.5% of them passed it on the first try. And for a person who's been in the profession a long time, who knows a lot of people who had to take this exam many, many, many times, I'm telling you that is something to be proud of. And I am very proud of my students. But I'd like to think that the ones who involve themselves in different engagements and take up all the opportunities that are offered and afforded to them in this program, do so, and that's the result of them being well prepared for the exam at the end of, of their training. Um, in addition to um, graduating, passing classes, passing the exam, graduating, part of the expectations of the scholarship is that you obtain full-time work, um, either with a state agency or a vendor agency that services, um, has service agreements with the state agency. What does that mean? The state agency is um, state VR or federal agency that works with individuals that have disabilities. That is their main clientele. Now what state VR, federal VR does is they don't provide all the services that that individual may need. They often uh, refer to work for clients out, provide other resources. So that's what a vendor is. You can also work for an agency that's a vendor, meaning that that's the kind of place that the VR agency will refer a person with disabilities, one of their clients to. That is also an eligibility requirement that's acceptable for you to work with one of those vendor type agencies as well. Your work um, must be equivalent to two years for each year you receive a scholarship. So this is a 60 credit program, which means that it is about, takes about two, two years and three semesters to complete. So you're roughly talking about 4.5 to five years of work with persons with disabilities in an agency that services that population post-graduation. Now, a lot of people say, well, that, does that mean that I pay it back? You're paying it back in the service. You're getting paid from that agency. It's a job. You keep your, 
your money. It's just that the requirement is that you provide proof that you're actually working for an agency that is servicing this population. That's why it's important for us to know that you're fully committed to actually working with this population. Whether you receive a scholarship or not, whether this opportunity is available, this is something that we want people that this is something that they were going to do regardless. This is just a bonus that this opportunity is happening for them at this time in their life. So the payback agreement understanding is something that you are required to sign upon coming on as a scholar. And it's, it's a disclosure that talks about the understanding that you do have to pay back in service as an obligation to receiving the scholarship funding throughout your master's program. And you must maintain contact with myself regarding your employment status following graduation because we do have to track it and Department of Education tracks it. We have to use the PIM system to track it. You put in the information, we verify it. So it is something that does continue until you satisfy your years of service agreement. Any questions? That's all the information. I'm pretty sure you kind of overload right now. But if you have any questions that you put in the, um, the link below, the chat below, uh, we will honor any of those at this moment. If anybody has any question they would like to address directly, you can definitely unmute yourself and ask Dr. Russell. I have a question. Um, usually, at what time do these classes start um, when you get into the master's program? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Um, the master's program is a, is a um, professional program. So a lot of our students work. All of our classes start around 5 or 6.30. Most of them start at 5, 5 to 7.40. No classes are offered during the daytime. And no classes are offered on, on Fridays. So Hi, your, class, your classes will be Monday through Thursday in the evening, evening afternoon. And that's about three classes um, since it's nine credit a full time? Correct. Okay. Three classes a semester. So and you know we it we work on a cohort model so your classes will already be kind of designed and scheduled for you so we try to stagger it to where we have some online classes we have some in person classes so each semester you'll have at least one online class and well right now we're all remote but if we ever go back to campus and, and in person you'll have usually two in person classes a semester and at least one online class thank you so much You're welcome. hi dr russell i also hi. have a question sure. um can you describe a typical day for the vocational rehab counselor <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say it varies, but in general, most of it is like scheduling appointments, meeting with the client, sometimes doing intake interviews to determine eligibility or needs, um, providing resources, maybe sending them out to different appointments that they need, maybe a psychologist, maybe a professional vocation evaluator, maybe um, an, an additional testing for to determine their um, disability eligibility, um, helping them facilitate that type of um, um, services, um, sometimes meeting with vendors, getting um, collaborating with them, maybe doing marketing to determine better vendors than, <clears throat> than the ones that you have to ensure that your clients are getting the best services. So a variety of those things, as well as trainings and continuing professional development for yourself as well. Thank you so much. Um, can you also describe the coursework that, we, that the students will be going through in the graduate program? 
Well, <clears throat> like I said, the rehab counseling program is a part of the counselor education program. So that means that a core of your courses will be clinical counseling courses. Approximately 36 of your course credits will be from general counseling classes. So you're learning skills and techniques, you're learning about ethical procedures, the proper procedures of counseling, you're learning about assessments, um, you're learning all of those tools of career counseling and um, that and determining eligibility and determining individuals um, career paths. Um, you're learning psychopathology. You're learning about substance abuse disorders and addictions. So you're learning all of that core counseling information. And then you'll have um, your, your specialization courses in rehab, which is where we will talk more about um, the principles and practices of rehab counseling, study the legislation, the significance of the legislation. We'll talk about psychosocial aspects and attitudes and how that affects persons with disabilities. You'll learn more um, specifics about the medical aspects, learning all the different types of chronic illnesses and the responses that um, should occur when you're working with a client that might have these chronic illnesses and disabilities. Um, and you'll learn about the, the different field experiences um, that you will have that in the different site placements in terms of those those field experiences and those client populations. Thank you so much. Um, for my last question, I was just wondering if I have a passion for doing psychotherapy for individuals with chronic illness disabilities, would this be the right program for me? Um, if you wanna be a, a therapist like every day you're seeing clients for an hour is that what you're asking correct um rehab counselors are trained to do therapy but most of our days the days of them are not spent doing one-on-one -on -one therapy sessions there are times that they do that with their clients but that is not what they do all day every day most of it is about resource finding uh, working with the client to determine what needs um, are available for them in the community and helping them get to them. Now, a lot of times they do have vendors that they send out if a client, they feel like there's situational stressors that are happening that may be blocking their efforts to find employment or to do well with seeking employment, they may recommend six sessions of psychotherapy for a client that you know, that that's on their caseload. And that referral source would be someone, who, you know, who does psychotherapy all day. And that would be a vendor. Like I talked about vendors, you could be a vendor for, in, for, for the agency for them to send clients to when they need at least a minimum of six psychotherapy sessions to work through some stressors or some um, extenuating circumstances that may be blocking their readiness for employment. I also thank you so much. Dr. Oh. Russell, we have a couple people with their hands raised. I'd like to acknowledge from the chat. Danina Stokes has her hand raised. Sure. Go ahead, um, Danina. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I had put my question in the chat box, but that's okay. My um I'm finishing up with my second master's degree. I'm also a senior counselor with uh, vocational rehabilitation for the state already. I may only need, I think, maybe two or three classes. So this program, because I missed the first beginning, my power went out, um, is basically you have to come to class. It's nothing online at all. We have some courses that are online. Um, depending on... But, but this is not an online program. Um, okay, okay. Depending on your master's degrees, Danina, have you looked at CRC to see if um, what courses you would need in yes, order to get your certification? Yes, ma'am. I think I only need, I think, about three classes. The last time I looked, I haven't looked at it again. Um, I wanted to see how this program was, and I said I may go 
and see if I was able to transfer all of my credits. You, yeah, we, we, we won't, we'll only transfer up to 12 credits. Oh, okay. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it might behoove you to, to apply for CRC and then let them tell you what classes you're missing and then come and become a, um, become a non-degree seeking student. And then you can take those classes in the program. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's because I'm I'm at my wit's end with this last master's degree. I don't want to take a full another one. <laughs> I don't blame you. I don't blame you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. But if you have any questions, you can contact me. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome. We have uh, Monica Parker Lewis has her hand raised. Monica. Hi. I was Hi. I was wondering most of the um people you work with are they um older already you know um more of adults or, or is there um a need for this like with adolescents or or um you know graduating high schoolers or yeah. college students Great question um I like to I like to kind of describe rehab counseling profession is kind of the profession that picks up where um, special special education stops because our population is um, transitional age students up until term of life. So absolutely what you're describing is um, the high school, like from 14 up, we call those transition age students. And, you know, there are actually a lot of programs right now that are getting a lot of funding to, to be more supportive of that population of individuals. And we used to have special, they used to have specialized units that only serve as transitional age students. But now it's been recommended that every office infuses um, transitional age students within their, their um, caseloads. So if that's a, your population of interest, that is definitely viable for this profession. Thank you, it is. Um, Natalie Reyes Cordero. Natalie. Okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I was trying to unmute myself and I, I, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, perfect. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I continue asking in the, chat, but in the chat, but I wasn't able to get a response. I, yes, this is something that I'm interested in, but I've also uh, in the future would have liked to do, um, get my licensure in mental health counseling. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know if this specific master's um, is something that will allow me to get that as well. Well, when I talked about us, you taking the core counseling courses. Um, okay. If you go on the licensure and this is where this is all KCREF accredited. If you go on the licensure um, website, all of the required courses that you would need for licensure, um, you'll take. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, Great. You you'll take um, because it's just the requirement of the populations that I know you will be utilizing for uh, rehab counseling. So you will satisfy those basic requirements. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. That was like, apart from everything else, that was actually one of my various concerns, but thank you so much for letting me know. Now mm -hmm. I'm like even more towards the program than I was a few minutes ago. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. We have Hannah Thomas. Hannah? Hi, yes. My question was actually the same as uh, Natalie's too. I was um, concerned with um, if I would be able to apply for um, L LMHC license licensure after completing the program. Well, keep in mind again, if you're going to be a you, you can if you're going to be a scholar, your focus should be on you know getting employment that works with persons with disabilities. The yes. licensure, um, the basic courses that you need to take are there. Uh, remember, after you graduate, you have to be registered as an intern for two years post-graduation for LMHC um, considerations. 
in addition to taking the 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 class, the exam for that as well. Okay. This program merely provides the educational back um, ground that is needed. You, there is additional work that has to be done for the obtaining of that licensure process. Okay, thank you. Sure. Just if your I will I will say if your sole interest and your desire interest is mental health counseling, then I strongly encourage you to apply to the mental health to the mental health track, not the rehab track. If that is what your passion and interest is. All right, um, Jessica Abdallah. Hi, good evening. Um, so my question is for the scholarship. So you have to get admitted to the program first, right? Yes. And then you apply to the scholarship. Yes. Is that like how does that happen? It's just a application it's a supplemental application once you're admitted we'll usually send it to you and it's just kind of i don't know it's even just maybe a half a pager and you write like a paragraph or two about why you feel like you should be awarded the scholarship and then we schedule your interview based off of that information it's not a it's not a, another complete process the biggest component is getting accepted to the program Right. Um, and, and, you know, we will contact you. We'll be in contact whenever you express that you're interested in the scholarship. And if you're working with us with the application pre-screening, we'll stay in contact with you uh, regarding the next steps. Perfect. Thank you. Sure. Adrian Gutierrez. Uh, how are you doing? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, perfect. All right. Um, so in regards to um, this program, in regards to like where rehabilitation is, um, what are there like any limitations you would say like in regards to like what your client field would be? Because I mean, I'll be honest with myself. Um, I do have like a strong passion for therapy, but like seeing this potential like avenue of like a career field, like it did pique my interest enough to at least like listen to what had to be said. Sure. And, yeah, I was just curious, like, is there, like, any sort of, like, limitations as to far, like, like, who gets rehabilitation, like, you know, like, for example, like, um, previous drug addicts or those who, like, are suffering from Alzheimer's or, you know, people that could be, like, potential clients for, like, a therapist, like, would they also be potential clients for um, those who provide rehabilitation services? Maybe. Um, well... The requirements of receiving services from either state agencies or federal agencies is that you have a disability as defined by Social Security Administration. And that's something that you have it, something that is um, limiting one major function of your life, that you have a recorded record of it and you are seen as having that disability. So oftentimes people may have disorders People may, you know, have an addiction to, to a substance or a circumstance, but just because you may have a disorder or, or a diagnosis does not mean you have a disability, yeah. okay? Yeah. So there is a difference that is the, that, that we do decipher, and a lot of people group those wordings together, and they're actually quite separate. Yeah. So yeah. that's why I said sometimes, maybe Sometimes yes, sometimes no. A lot of people think rehab and they go automatically to drugs and substance abuse. However, um, one of those requirements of being eligible for um, R is that if you do have a history of substance abuse or an addiction, that you're clean, you know, that you're not actively using, that you are working a program or have worked a program. So it is usually a secondary diagnosis is usually not the primary reason they're there. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Sure. Nobody else actually has their hand raised. Um, so if there are any more questions, feel free to ask. I also think um, we can leave the chat open and continue answering questions. Um, if anybody needs to leave or, you know, you can go ahead and ask Dr. Russell now. Well, I 
truly thank each and every one of you for coming and for your very pointed um, and, and good questions that you've asked. And hopefully you provide, we've get provided you some more clarity on the scholarship opportunity. And if after this you have more questions, please feel free to reach out to us.